Bizarre Brain Comics. Listen, do you hear them, my friends? They know the story we are going to talk about tonight. Yes, it is I, the Dark Librarian, again, here to tell tales of terror here in the October Halloween season. <laughs> and I'm here for Bizarre Brain Comics. Oh, Mr. Bones, he is here with us. Hmm. And this little feature here is what we'll be talking about. This is Werewolf by Night, number one from 1972, Marvel Comics. Written by Jerry Conway. And drawn by Mike Plug. Plug, Plug, Plug. That's a funny name. Plug. Ha 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 ha. York keeping guard on the big book of knowledge. Hmm. <laughs> blood. <sighs> to moisten the palate. Okay. And werewolf by night. After the relaxation of the Comics Code in 1971, Marvel Comics and other publishers began returning to horror comics featuring supernatural menaces such as vampires, zombies, and werewolves. The Jack Russell version of the character, based on an idea by Roy Thomas and fleshed out in comics by Jerry Conway and Mike Plug, made his first appearance in Marvel Spotlight No. 2 in 1972 where it ran through issue four before getting his own title, which ran for 43 issues until 1977. Now, Jerry Conway, he was the writer here, he was born in 1952, and he is known for creating the, Pub uh, the Punisher and the first Ms. Marvel and scripting the, uh, the death of Gwen Stacy story in Amazing Spider-Man. And at DC Comics, he created Power Girl, the Chase and Todd version of Robin, and Killer Croc, and wrote the first Superman vs. Spider-Man crossover story. And he has a long and distinguished career of writing for various publishers on a host of popular characters, as well as writing for a variety of animated and live-action TV series, as well as the films Fire and Ice and Conan the Destroyer. Just a brief overview. So, we like horror. We like werewolves and monsters, and lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. <laughs> so, let's take a look at Werewolf by Night. Oh. Yes, Werewolf by Night, number one. As I said, that initially started in uh, Marvel Spotlight number two through four. So, we're right in the middle of a storyline here. 
because they can carry things over. Here we have what covers those. This uh, is the Essential Werewolf by Night, using the same illustration. This is a great cover illustration by Mike Plug. <clears throat> and this and this runs through uh, two through four, and then through uh, number twenty-one of Werewolf by Night, with uh, a couple of crossovers with. Uh, Dracula and Marvel team up and uh, giant sized creatures. A lot of good stuff in there. And it's, and the, even that is mostly drawn by Mike Plouk. Great, great stuff. Great. I really like his stuff. And I'll cover him more at, a, at another time because there's no shortage of, of, of great old Mike Plouk stuff. Okay. Now we see here that the, uh, the werewolf is looks a lot like the uh, the Wolfman from the Universal movies. Of course, he is a little bit different. Uh, raggedy pants, no shirt. He always had a shirt in the uh, in the movies because it cut down on the makeup costs. But there's no such makeup costs here, and it, and I really love that. Mike Plug's version of the of the werewolf. I guess in the mid '80s, uh, when they brought the character back, uh, Bill Sikowski had a, com a completely different version, um, looking a little more like a werewolf from the um, I can't remember. Now, all of a sudden, can't remember the name. Oh, the Howling, the Howling. Yeah, I, I prefer this. But I, that's nothing bad about that because I love the werewolves in the in the Howling as well. But I just love this. Of course, uh, can't use the uh, the universal version of the creature. Let's get into it here. Great splash page, and you can barely see the uh, the credits kind of hidden over here in the in the rock wall. Yeah, but we see here that the werewolf has been turned to stone. Here's the full moon. Uh, continuing a story from a, uh, from a, a spotlight story. And here the here he is. And he's beginning to be able to think again, just a little bit. The moon is going down and the sun comes up and he transforms back into Jack Russell, which is fortunate for him that the, uh, the magical stone transformation is not permanent in his case. And here's his buddy Buck. Finds him, helps him, helps him back to their house. Now I really like. Here we get a real good one. The uh, Mike Plug art here. His style is just wonderful for the horror genre. He because uh, he did uh, this and um, uh, Fra uh, Frankenstein Monster. He did uh, uh, Planet of the Apes. He did some uh, uh, call the uh, Call the Conqueror, right in the transition there from Call the Conqueror to Call the Destroyer. And uh, he later did uh, some fantasy stuff for, our, for on Marvel, the Weird, Weird World. I want to talk about that sometime. So, and from what I understand, I'll have to get more on my, my research. If I remember correctly, he had worked with Will Eisner uh, before, before this, and you can... <clears throat> and we'll cover Will Eisner at another time, but in my eyes, I can really see, especially in these first stories here, can really, really see um, strong Will Eisner influence in his in his uh, line work, his figures, uh, and uh, especially his his female characters. So here we are. And there's something about this book that they're trying to keep from these people. They're uh, now they're hiding. Someone comes in to look, and there it is through that shattered window. And here's this the lady. Her her invalid father, who is a big villain, and their henchman, big muscular fellow. Hmm. This character's name is Marlene, and then her father, and she wears these glasses. Really striking there. They really see 
uh, uh, Will Eisner influence in that in that face there. So our friends escaped, has he? How unfortunate for our dear Mr. Russell. How very, very unfortunate for him. So they go, you hear that, Buck? So then they, they take off, get off that island. Nice, nice drawing of that aircraft. And this is in uh, California, if I remember correctly. It's unusual because most things happen in New York. Here we are, and they're talking, and he gets a, doing some, doing some research, and uh, gets a call from his sister, Lisa. I don't know if that's supposed to be pronounced Lisa or Lisa. I'll just call her Lisa, it's easier. And there's, I think there's something wrong with her father, or stepfather anyway. And he isn't here just now, because he's got, somehow got Jack Russell, and somehow got him involved in all of this. And I guess, um, find out that uh, Jack's father was a was a werewolf and he and he inherited inherited it because he's young, just a young man 1920 or something like that maybe 21 and when he came of age he he got the curse of the vampire uh, correction of the werewolf and so here the big goon guy crashes in because they need to get just knocks buck out and here they are jack fights back but then marlene and her father with jack's sister lisa as a hostage so he must he must comply with their wishes because they want this book they get the book and they take jack and here they are when they recover it's got Buck and Lisa tied together, and it's nighttime in in the in the apartment. Jack comes to, and he makes makes a dash. Tries to subdue them or distract them, and he and he makes a run for it, dashing Marlene aside, and goes through the sliding door. And Lisa, whoa. Please, Jack, don't leave me. I can't, because he can feel, he can feel the moon coming up and the transformation coming, and he doesn't want to be here. He can't be here. He runs runs through the, the hippie-laden streets of the city. Where, and he feels the moon and the, the compelling draw of the moon. It's a great figure. Look at these great figures. And the transformation begins. He's... He is resigning himself to the transformation. He can't fight it any longer. He hated having to leave Lisa behind, Lisa and Buck behind, but he knew that if he transformed there, their lives would be in danger. And here we get the great, a great, marvelous transformation scene. I'm transforming, getting hard to breathe, can't... Uh, uh, and here it is, the second night of the full moon. Oh, look at that. Great, great. Oh, his great anatomy. His his figures. He had, I love his his style of artwork. And it's just, but it's it's marvelously grotesque. He does some great stuff. I, I, I remember, I can't remember what horror movie it was. And there was something in there that made me think, that looks like something that Mike Plug would uh would do and speaking of of movies he he did a lot of the artwork for the uh the still artwork for um fire and ice too but this was a horror movie that i'm thinking of and i looked and i and i saw in the in the credits you seldom see credits for uh, storyboards in movies especially anymore but it sure enough it was mike pluke who had done, done the storyboards for this for this movie so here he is werewolf going through the city he still has a little bit of his of Jack Russell's mind. Eh, not much, though. It's mostly the thoughts of the Beast. And, and the Beast re remembers this character here. He goes back to the house that he had just come from, which is what Jack wanted to get away from. And there's the goon. Oh, look at that. Look at that attack. Attack and this great battle shot here. Great battle shot. Great page layout. Great, great, great visual storytelling. 
And this goon guy, he's so big. He's so big. He doesn't want, he does not want to, to fight the, uh, the werewolf because in the previous issue, the werewolf had actually saved his life intentionally or not. But he has come, he has made himself the ent entire slave of Marlene and he must obey to fight and destroy the werewolf if he can, but he can't destroy him. And there he goes. His, his agility, just like Spider-Man, swings up and then turns around and, re and attacks. Oh, look at that. They're locked arm in arm, battling. And Marlene is un dissatisfied and takes out her, a gun and knowing that it'd be no... While the werewolf is now virtually unconscious and, and out of the fight, she shoots... What was his name? Garth? Uh, don't need to shoot. Strug would have stopped him. Strug would have done what you asked. Hasn't Strug always done what Miss asked? And here is a very poignant scene of, uh, of, of Strug struggling to remain conscious, remain on his feet until he collapses and dies. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. As the wolf recovers, the beast recovers. Too many pages of ads here. So here they are face to face, and Marlene knows how to, how to defeat the, the beast again, just as she had in the, previously, because she is a mutant, and her mutant power is this. She, here she is, removes her glasses. Here, oh, this is a great scene. You can see the reflection in her glasses of the face of the beast. Ah, and he feels the power on her, on him. He struggles. He struggles and slides down to reveal that he was standing right in front of a mirror. So Marlene and her father are looking right at Marlene and right into her, her eyes in the mirror, which transforms them both to stone. And there's the beast. Arr. Sees the others. Are they victims? It could be. Lisa regains consciousness, comes face to face with the beast. But, unlike Jack's fears, the beast does not harm her and takes off. Oh, look at this. The ink work. Beautiful work in that, in the figure. Making making him a sleek coat and the expression. A great expression. Not just bestial savagery, but intelligence, an innate intelligence. And here he runs almost struck kind of a trope, almost struck by a car. He runs into the woods. Oh there he is. Free, free to run run wild and free in the woods. Be a free beast of the wild. Runs with the pack to hunt, and in the morning he transforms back and walks back to the city. And then we see that ha! He had the book hidden in a box of cornflakes, and that's what that's what they gave their lives for was that book. And here we see oh well. <laughs> the uh, are, are the villains of this story now on display in an art gallery as sculptures. Oh, that's that's great, very ironic, and very just. And here's Jack, and Lisa, and Buck, and only they know the truth. They probably don't even know the truth. Only Jack knows the real truth, and that's the end of that. Oh, great. Oh, great. Mike Plug art. I think Jerry Conway did a great job. Did a great job in writing the story. This was probably the first thing I first issue I'd ever read of Werewolf by Night. I picked it up. We see the uh, the grease pencil writing here, which means it came came from the drugstore. It, my only source of comic books from a little BFE uh, uh, farming town. From when I was a kid, so I was about 12 years old.
Probably not even 12 years old when I picked this up. I've always always enjoyed it. I've got some some other books somewhere, especially crossovers. The, it, uh, um, as I said, these crossed over, crossed over with their other horror titles, as well as into the, the mainstream superhero continuities. So all, all the, the Marvel's continuing horror characters, Werewolf, Dracula, Frankenstein, the zombie, the living mummy, they're all in the same universe as Captain America and Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, that's great. It's a lot of a lot of fun. Not as quite as terrifying as uh, uh, the Wolfman stories because he does not kill innocent people. He has that moral moral center uh, uh, still in him from from Jack Russell. Uh, it's a fun little read. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure did. Um, if you get a chance, pick some Werewolf by Night up and, and read it if you can. Uh, in the Essentials. Or in back issue bins. If you can find them cheap. And, re and remember, comics are art!